uh, it's a pleasure to speak to, um, with you today about the role of sleep in the progression of, of dementia and specifically around sleep as a potential factor for brain resilience. Um, and I have the luxury of following Jasmir, who really did the best possible introduction for the stuff that I'm doing and making my job very easy when talking about dementia and the Alzheimer's continuum, um, because really most talks about Alzheimer's disease will have a very similar slide to this, just because as Jasmir was saying, so much of the way that we're thinking about Alzheimer's disease has changed with the development of these biomarkers. You know, it wasn't that long ago when I was an undergrad learning that Alzheimer's disease could only be diagnosed at, aut at autopsy, and that had really devastating consequences for these clinical trials that were being run where you really didn't know who was in, who was in your trial. Um, but now, as, as Jasmir introduced, we have these CSF biomarkers for amyloid and tau. We have uh, PET scans for amyloid and tau where we can actually see um, amyloid and tau in the brains of individuals who are still living. And it's really changed research and, and also for, for someone like a neurologist, clinical care as well. Um, so I won't spend too much time on this slide because you have seen something pretty much identical uh, in Daphne's slides, which is pretty typical for Alzheimer's. But you see this trajectory of development of amyloid, then you get this development of tau, development of neurodegeneration, and then you get the cognitive impairment with MCI and dementia. And so this is the what we would call this Alzheimer's disease continuum, biomarker positive symptom. Um, and when we think about how long is this continuum, um, from one of the studies, well, Jasmine's the uh, site PI, the Diane study, the dominantly inherited Alzheimer's network, follows these families with familial Alzheimer's disease. Am I getting a little feedback? A little bit. Um, follows these families with familial Alzheimer's disease. So these families have a causative gene variant. Um, for Alzheimer's disease. So if you follow these families and you identify who's carrying these variants in these families, you can identify who is going to get Alzheimer's disease. And it's a very unique, pure form of Alzheimer's disease, and they're very rare, but they provide a really um, interesting, valuable snapshot for, for researchers um, to try to uh, get at this timeline of these biomarker uh, progressions. And so what's unique about these families is you can look at their family history, you can know what the genetic variant is that they're carrying, and you can actually estimate when the dementia will onset. So you can have someone who's 25 years old, you know that they carry a specific variant, and you can look at their family history and you can say, well, we think, we can estimate that your dementia will onset at 55. And so you can say that they're 30 years approximately prior to the onset of dementia, and then use all of these biomarkers in the CSF and the PET scan to try and understand what is the timeline of progression in this preclinical, pre-dementia stage. And in, in this study, very recently, they've shown that on average, amyloid is accumulating in the brains um, about 20, 22 years before the onset of dementia. Um, you can see changes in FDG PET, 14 years, and the neurodegeneration about five years before the onset of cognitive decline. Now, this provides a big window of opportunity when we're thinking about resilience. How can we delay the onset of dementia? How can we extend that? But what's another important aspect when, with regards to resilience is the heterogeneity in progression. So in this study, even with familial Alzheimer's disease, you're going to see heterogeneity. And as soon as you start looking at sporadic Alzheimer's disease, the amount of variability in the progression is just vast. Um, so this is, you see that in terms of how long it takes the biomarkers to develop. And you also see that in how, how quickly they progress once the cognitive decline starts. And so this is just some data from the Alzheimer's clinic at UBC, where we were looking at the individuals who had done very standard clinical cognitive assessments, the MSC, and just looking at how they progress as they're being treated in the clinic and being followed in the clinic. Um, and this was in the context of a genetic study, looking at different genetic variability and how that could affect 
the heterogeneity of progression in, in cognitive decline. Um, and all I wanted you to see here is just, you know, in these 25 in first 25 individuals we did whole exome sequencing on, it's, it's vast. You have one individual who in three, four years goes from normal cognitive decline or normal cognitive performance, which would be like 30, a score of 30, um, all the way down to zero in just a few years. And then you have other people who can be followed literally for decades and never get to the severe dementia stage. So you have this really um, vast heterogeneity and it just makes you wonder, um, and, and this is something that Jasmine was talking about as well, is like, what is it about some individuals who progress, progress so quickly? Um, and what about the others who are progressing much more slowly? What is making them more resilient to seemingly the same pathology um, and the same similar disease? Of course, there's going to be subtypes, but you know, what is it about these individuals who have Alzheimer's disease that are seem more resilient and can have that really slow decline? And so one aspect that I've been looking at in my research uh, is sleep. And does poor sleep make you less resilient and perhaps make you progress through the Alzheimer's continuum more quickly, accumulating biomarkers or progressing in the cognitive decline more quickly? And conversely, does good sleep, good quality, good quantity help support resilience to either the biomarker progression or also the cognitive decline? And if so, can sleep interventions affect resilience? Can we target sleep to actually change the trajectory? So could we take somebody who was on more of a the path that Jasmine was talking about towards dementia and, and actually intervene, improve sleep, and shift it so they go more on a healthier aging trajectory. So why sleep? Well, individuals with Alzheimer's disease, similar to individuals who have other neurological diseases, neurodevelopmental diseases, psychiatric diseases, um, are known to have disrupted sleep. It's a very common thing for individuals coming into a dementia clinic to be complaining about disrupted sleep. Also for their caregivers um, have reported that actually disturbed sleep is sometimes the number one reason why families end up putting their loved ones in care facility just because it is so disruptive um, to the family unit um, and the support. So if you follow, if you take a cohort of individuals who have Alzheimer's disease uh, and you do sleep um, assessments, about 60% would meet the clinical diagnostic criteria for a sleep disorder. So over half. Uh, the majority of patients will be reporting disturbed sleep. For example, with sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, individuals with, with Alzheimer's disease are at a five times higher risk for presenting with apnea. So that seems to be one of the sleep disorders that is highly common or more common in individuals with Alzheimer's disease. If you look at their sleep uh, and just wanna characterize the sleep of individuals with, with dementia and Alzheimer's, we see a lot more sleep fragmentation where the individual is going to be waking up a lot at night. We see a lot more napping during the day, which suggests that either they're not getting the restorative sleep at night or that their circadian rhythm control of the sleep-wake cycle is off, which is pushing them to sleep during the day and be awake more at night. And if we do clinical polysomnographies and actually look at the different stages of sleep, we see a reduction in slow wave sleep, which is the non-REM N3 stage. And we um, sometimes also see a reduction in REM sleep, which is the rapid eye movement sleep, uh, which is when you would have your most vivid dreams. And slow wave sleep and REM sleep are two stages of sleep that have been investigated um, when looking at you know, the importance of sleep for learning and memory processes. So we weren't surprised that those are what come up um, in, in the case of dementia. And importantly, there's growing evidence that sleep disturbances are more than just a symptom and that they're actually a risk factor or a contributing factor to the Alzheimer's disease progression. So we can think about it. There's been preclinical work in, in rodent models, and there's even been a little bit uh, in humans showing that disturbing sleep for a night, like a night of sleep deprivation, or in, in rodents, you can look at that for sleep fragmentation over weeks, you actually get higher levels of tau aggregation 
amyloid aggregation. There was a, one study very preliminary in humans that showed one night of sleep deprivation actually caused a signal change on the amyloid PET from just one night in, in younger. But it was very small preliminary, but it was still you know, uh, insightful. And there's been work looking at uh, cerebral spinal fluid changes as well. So this idea is that if you have these chronic sleep disturbances, you know, for decades, if we're thinking about the development of Alzheimer's disease over decades, that this can contribute to the accumulation of these biomarkers, the tau, the amyloid, which are thought to be driving you along the Alzheimer's disease continuum. This then leads to neurodegeneration. Neurodegeneration often occurs, starts in areas of the brainstem, which are um, important for regulating sleep-wake cycle, which then contributes more to the symptoms, which are the sleep disturbances. And so you really have this cycle where sleep, some people refer to this as this bi-directional relationship between sleep disturbance and Alzheimer's disease, where it is a symptom of the disease, but it's also this really important modifiable risk factor or risk factor or contributing factor to the disease. And estimates have said that 15% of Alzheimer's disease could be prevented if we target sleep with interventions. Now, that is, um, might not seem like a huge amount, but when you consider the 50 million people worldwide who have dementia, it's, we're talking millions of people. If we could appropriately identify individuals with sleep disorders, intervene and, and potentially change this, this continuum. So if sleep is a modifiable risk factor that can affect resilience, what aspect of sleep should we be targeting with intervention? Because not all stages of sleep, not all aspects of sleep um, are the same. So one way that I've looked at this is I've tried to phenotype uh, the sleep of Alzheimer's mouse model. So we've done pretty extensive phenotyping of sleep. We've looked at circadian rhythms in these transgenic mouse models as well. And what we found is if you look at total amount of sleep, you don't really see a huge difference between a mouse that has amyloid or tau accumulating in its brain um, compared to the wild type. Um, but there's been a big push in sleep research and sleep clinics generally, well, maybe not sleep clinics yet, but there should be, uh, moving away from these traditional sleep staging approaches where we were just looking at the different sleep stages scored by uh, clinical tech, and moving more towards quantifiable aspects of EEG and sleep. So looking more at oscillations and, and looking at power. So what we did in our mice is we looked at the power spectra of the EEG that we were recording. And what we found was even though we weren't seeing a signal in terms of the amount of sleep or even the, the general sleep stages, because in mice you only see REM and non-REM, um, when you're doing the staging, you can't do the, the more specific staging that we can do in humans, is we found that there was lower power in the EEG signal in the slow wave frequency. So this is an indication that they were getting less of the slow wave sleep, the slow oscillations, um, which had also been identified in patients. And we found this in three out of four of the transgenic mouse models that we studied, which was quite robust for finding in, in transgenic mice. So transgenic mouse models of Alzheimer's are not known for being the most reliable model for neurological diseases. There's a lot of problems um, with translating what we find in mice um, and also replicating it between mouse models. Uh, so the fact that we found the same reduction in slow wave sleep in three out of the four transgenic mouse models, and they were three amyloid models, not our model, which also included tau, but again, it, it could also be the age with the way that these age-related diseases um, are progressing even in the model. We thought we were onto something. So working with Hawk and Nygaard at the Clinic for Alzheimer's Disease at UBC, what we did is we wanted to study sleep in the home environment uh, in patients with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. So the reason we wanted to study in the home environment was because individuals with dementia are prone to delirium when you bring them into the clinic and have them sleep in the hospital overnight. And so we were thinking that we were gonna be able, it would be better for the individuals and we'd also be able to get a larger sample size if we were able to do this in the home environment. So we worked with a company called Cognionics to develop a very comfortable headband um, because people don't like sleeping with things um, pressed against their head. 
with two frontal electrodes. And we did a polysomnography validation where we had individuals, healthy individuals sleep in the lab, wear the headband, and make sure that we were able to stage sleep in that way. And what we found in when we actually did this in the home environment with individuals with Alzheimer's disease is that we saw a reduction specifically in the N3 stage. So again, we were seeing this signal around slow wave sleep. And with this novel headband and this novel scoring approach, we were actually most confident in this finding with N3 because that was the stage where you're most likely to score accurately with frontal electrodes. Not all of the stages are as easy to identify just using frontal electrodes, but slow wave oscillations are an N3. So we saw this reduction in N3 that was very similar to what we were seeing in the mice with the reductions of slow wave sleep. And this work that we did in the mice and in the humans really fits with some growing evidence uh, in the field that's showing that slow wave sleep is an important aspect of sleep that's relevant to Alzheimer's disease specifically. Um, studies have shown that the suppression of slow wave sleep specifically, so they follow somebody in the lab, as soon as they go into stage N3 or show these slow oscillations, they wake them up slightly um, to get them out of that stage. They've shown that this can affect amyloid levels in cerebral spinal fluid overnight. Uh, studies that have really tried to understand glymphatic clearance, which is this perivascular convection flow of CSF in the brain um, that increases during sleep. They've shown that actually the slow wave oscillation somehow entrains or pulses this convective flow. And so it's really important in trying to increase this glymphatic clearance during sleep, slow wave oscillations seem to be quite uh, important for that. Um, other groups have looked at slow wave sleep as a moderating factor, um, specifically around how amyloid is affecting hippocampal dependent memory tasks. So um, how are we tackling this now? If, if slow wave sleep is something that we should be looking at, um, how are we tackling this now? Well, I started my lab at SFU a couple years ago, so it's still new. Uh, and we're trying to take a translational approach, just building on the work that I've done previously, working in mouse models of Alzheimer's disease, and also in, in human individuals, either at risk or with the disease. Um, so given that the lab is, is new, given that there was COVID, uh, things are a little bit slow. My trainees have been amazing and patient with all of the delays in getting things. I'll tell you about some of the projects that we're working on now, but I don't have any answers for you yet, but my trainees, and I are working hard to get those. Um, so one of the first things I'd like to share with how we're trying to tackle this uh, question about, you know, how is slow wave, wave sleep affecting resilience in Alzheimer's disease um, is one project led by Dr. Sean Toth uh, and Taha and Mayuko, who you've seen walking around with the microphones, uh, they've been working on this. And what they're trying to do is use optogenetic modulation um, to affect sleep and specifically slow wave sleep in these mouse models. So they have the optogenetics working uh, and they're trying to stimulate GABAergic inner neurons in the TRN, the thalamic reticular nucleus, as a way to increase slow wave sleep. So you'll see in this video, they're using the optogenetic uh, stimulation to try and get those oscillations to increase slow wave sleep in, in the brain. Um, and the TRN is something that we're targeting because it has been reported to modulate uh, aspects of non-REM sleep, like slow wave sleep, but also in mouse models of Alzheimer's disease and also in human AD Alzheimer's disease, uh, there has been purported TRN dysfunction. So it could be something that's underlying or an area of the brain that's underlying the sleep disturbances that's associated with Alzheimer's disease. Um, so another... So another study, which um, if you were here yesterday, you might have seen the poster. Uh, this study is uh, looking at the effects of mild traumatic brain injury um, or concussion on Alzheimer's mice and the effects on sleep. And so this project is run by Jeffrey and Victoria, who were at the poster yesterday. Uh, and it's in collaboration with Cheryl Wellington's lab at UBC, where we're using her um, concussion model um, using Chimera, which is a closed head impact model. Brian Christie mentioned it a little bit yesterday in his talk on traumatic brain injury. 
um, and the benefits of having a closed head injury that's more translatable to what we see in human concussion or mild traumatic brain injury. So this project is ongoing, it's in the early stages, but we're seeing increases in uh, biomarkers like neurofilament light, um, which are indicators of neurodegeneration after uh, traumatic brain injury. This work is done one month after traumatic brain injury. We're also seeing higher levels of amyloid pathology, even in these early ages. So we were looking in this first study at six months of age, which is just at the onset of amyloid. So even at six months of age, traumatic brain injury is showing um, one month later, higher levels of amyloid pathology. Um, and we're looking at sleep. We haven't, we're also looking at seizure activity if you saw the poster yesterday, but I won't talk about that in, in this talk on sleep. Um, but what one month post uh, TBI, we're not seeing changes in sleep, but we've recorded the EEG in the first 72 hours after traumatic brain injury, following them longer as well. Um, and we're also looking at the different ages. So does a traumatic brain injury or concussion affect sleep or seizure activity or pathology differently if we are doing it early before amyloid onset or when the mouse is older, when you already have extensive pathology in the brain? And how does that, that change? Um, the, the goal of this work and also the goal um, with the optogenetics work, looking at slow wave sleep, is to understand how sleep is contributing to the pathology um, and also to do interventions. So the optogenetics could be an intervention which very cleanly modulates that aspect of sleep. Um, and here we would be considering different interventions as well if we're seeing sleep disturbances. So after someone has a concussion, should we be targeting um, sleep interventions as a way of reducing risk of neurodegeneration or um, amyloid or tau pathology later on. So in humans, anyone who saw posters today, uh, my master's student, Ina, um, is leading a study which is looking at what cognitive tests are most sensitive to sleep. And why this is really important um, is because if we are going to do sleep targeted interventions in individuals at risk for dementia or individuals with dementia, we need to know what cognitive measures are most sensitive so that we can actually see the effect. Because if you're trying to improve sleep and they're having some improvement, but you're using the wrong cognitive tests or tests that aren't sensitive, you're going to miss it. And not all cognition is going to be sensitive to these types of sleep manipulation. So identifying what tests are most sensitive is really a critical first step. So Ina um, is using starting with the Cambridge Neuropsychological Test Automated Battery, the CANTAB battery. And so this is a, a cognitive testing platform that's used um, a lot more in England, Cambridge, um, where you can test the individuals using uh, iPads. And so it's very portable uh, and it's, it's a really nice way. That's a nice model of this reverse translation. It was actually developed in the 90s by looking at uh, cognitive tests and assessments that were used in primate research and people thought, hey, we should actually learn from this and improve the types of cognitive tests that we're using with human and human patients of getting away from paper-based tests and using more of these computerized tests, which allow us to get a lot of different markers and measurements. Um, and so it's used quite a lot there in, in clinical trials and in, in the clinic. We're also using it because the touch screen cognitive testing that we're using with our mice were developed to be as similar as possible to the CANTAB platform. So trying to improve the translation of our work and making sure that any of the cognitive improvements that we're seeing in our mice map on most closely to what we're seeing in our human is really important. Uh, a lot of the cognitive work that was done in these Alzheimer's models, mouse models initially, or things like the Morris water maze, where you put a mouse in a, a maze and have them swim around to find a platform, or you put them in fear conditioning chambers and you shock them. And that is not how we test cognition in humans. So if we're trying to see cognitive improvement in our mouse models that's relevant to human disease, using this kind of um, translationally focused touchscreen cognitive testing is really important. So the other aspect and what we are, are most focused on is a test called the mnemonic similarity test. And this is a test 
that really tries to tap into a process called pattern separation. And it's pattern separation that we hypothesize is actually going to turn out to be the most sensitive to sleep um, disruption. And this is something that hasn't been studied before, but pattern separation has been shown to be a very subtle aspect of cognition that, that is impaired early in the Alzheimer's disease trajectory continuum, so um, in mild cognitive impairment. And it leads to what we see in patients sometimes as an increase in false memory, more so than just forgetfulness or forgetting. It's actually a, this false memory that's coming from um, confusion of very similar memory. So the, you get these overlapping inputs of similar uh, um, events in your episodic memory, and they're not stored distinctly if there's a failure of pattern separation. So this is something that Ina is looking at. So far, she's looked at um, healthy individuals, young individuals, college students, um, just looking at a cor correlation between their their sleep habits um, and performance and also in sleep deprivation. Um, and one thing that I've, I've mentioned to some of you already is what was really striking about our study looking at 24 hours of sleep deprivation is how resilient undergraduates are to 24 hours of sleep deprivation. Because we were shocked with some of these measures how the sleep deprived group actually wasn't performing so much worse than the rested group of these undergrads. So we don't know if they're resilient or whether or not our rested undergrads were absolutely not rested. So we have to take that into better consideration when we do these types of studies in the future. Um, but now that we've finished the, the young adult study, Ina has already started um, studying these processes in older adults, um, which we're, we're really excited about. And finally, the last study I wanted to tell you about is something that we're just starting. Uh, it's called the Brain Resilience Study. So very fitting way to end this conference. <laughs> um, and so this study is in partnership with Parveen Batty, who is the scientific director at the BC Generations Project um, and our fearless leader, Randy McIntosh, organizer for the conference today, um, and his platform of the virtual brain. And so what we're doing, um, we're recruiting individuals from the BC Generations Project. And, and the BC Generations Project is the largest prospective study of chronic disease and health in British Columbia. They recruited 30,000 individuals starting in, in 2009. And they have extensive information about sociodemographic information, lifestyle information, health information, family information. And as we've learned for the last three days, looking at these social factors, looking at these lifestyle factors are critical if we're going to understand brain resilience, healthy aging, all of these factors. Now, this study is run out of BC Cancer and they also have blood samples. So I'll look at uh, Jasmine about that because he did say, make sure you collect blood if you're gonna be looking at cognitive aging. They have blood samples, um, but what they don't have as part of the study yet and which is what we're bringing to the table is we're gonna look at brain health measures. And one of the brain health measures that we're gonna be looking at is sleep. So in this cohort, um, we're gonna start not with 30,000, probably targeting 100 and hope that with increased funding, we can study more and more of this really um, valuable cohort. But we're gonna be doing sleep diaries, um, actigraphy, which is like Fitbit that allow you to look at sleep wake patterns, uh, at home EEG with these portable EEGs, We'll be looking at circadian rhythm um, biomarkers, cognitive testing, and then neuroimaging, and then using Randy's virtual brain platform to try and model um, resilience and how these factors contribute in, into um, long-term brain aging um, and, and dementia markers as well. Um, so we're pretty excited about starting um, this study. And what I'll also just mention what's really unique about this cohort is because this was uh, set up through the province, um, they're hoping to follow these individuals for 50 years. And we are also hoping to follow these individuals prospectively and bring them in. But what's unique is that these individuals through this study are also linked directly to some of the health registries in the province. So there's one registry called the Chronic Disease Registry where if you're diagnosed by your family doctor or a specialist with a specific chronic disease, um, that you go into this registry. And if you're part of the brain resilience study, it gets linked to your study profile um, in this study. 
So there's a way to do longitudinal follow-up without actually having to bring individuals in. So we're gonna be able to see if any of our individuals, any of our participants end up getting diagnosed with dementia um, like Alzheimer's disease. So while we hope to do prospective study, prospective neuro, neuroimaging study requires funding, which we're trying to get more of, uh, but even if we can't, this is such a valuable cohort because they're linked to these health registries. So I just want to say thank you. Um, it has been a great three days. I appreciate you sticking around. Thank you to the funding and thank you to my amazing, resilient trainees who have dealt with all of the frustrations of being in a new lab, trying to wait for our wet lab to open, which I got an email today, which says, sounds like we're only a few weeks away. We've heard that before, but <laughs> um, I just want to say thank you to everybody for my amazing trainees. Thank you for the conversation. Um, we have two questions, uh, more about the treatment of the talk. Uh, so for the family nuclear and familial problem, uh, how far back in the family does it like affect? Is it just like grandparents or is it like big grandparents? So with these autosomal dominant mutations, um, so in these particular studies in terms of following, they probably, I doubt that they would have many more family members beyond grandparents. I mean, Jasmine would be the one to, to know. Um, but just given age and disease history, I, I don't imagine they have too many more generations beyond grandparents. Maybe there's a great grandparent in the study, but I don't know. But in terms of these, these genes, they should be, they would, these autosomal dominant um, mutations, these, these genes are, go back beyond the grandparents. But in the actual study cohort themselves, I, I doubt there's too many great grandparents or great great grandparents um, yeah but these families they know like it's 50 percent of the family members who would have these causal genes so they're very aware it's not something that would sneak up it's not something that you have to think oh i don't know about my great grandparents you you wouldn't you're very aware if your family has this kind of risk okay yeah. they're, they're learning that i have okay. um and then um for with the intervention uh the yeah so uh no we won't be doing optogenetics in humans uh the benefit of doing optogenetics uh is that you can get a really clean um signal so we can target specific areas of the brain, specific networks of, of cells, circuits, um, and see an effect, right? If that is the case, then you'll have to either target with different um, pharmacology um, or, or different interventions that could be behavioral uh, with slow wave sleep. Um, one that it seems quite promising and is actually already happening in clinics is an antidepressant called trazodone. So trazodone was started as an antidepressant. Now it's mostly prescribed as a sleep therapy. It actually increases slow wave sleep. And in memory clinics, this is very preliminary data that's been presented at conferences, but they've actually shown that following the individuals who've been prescribed trazodone and the ones who haven't, it actually, they show slower cognitive decline. So more research is needed into this, but this idea that, oh, actually maybe improving sleep through something like trazodone, um, which seems like a relatively safe intervention in older adults, which a lot of the sleep drugs are not, um, could actually have an impact. More research is, is needed there. With slow wave sleep, other people have looked at in the lab and a way to entrain slow wave oscillation with like a rocking bed. So literally a four hertz rocking bed somehow seems to entrain these neural oscillations that increases slow wave sleep. Other people have used auditory stimulation, um, and there's been a lot of push lately now that we were looking at these sleep oscillations, even outside sleep, 
you see this in the in the gamma uh, neurotech world where just having al Alzheimer's patients sit and get light entrainment with gamma frequencies is thought that it could have a clinical benefit. And so you could do the same thing with potentially with slow wave oscillations um, if you're trying to target slow wave sleep, perhaps even outside of sleep. But no, we won't be using optogenetics in humans. We're not allowed. <laughs> There's a question from Janine Martin on Zoom, and this is really in relation to the concussion study. So you mentioned that the testing started one month post MCBI of concussion. Why is that? Uh, could the testing be done two weeks post concussion? Yeah, so we, we are actually doing EEG recordings the day of concussion now. Um, this very first experiment that we did was looking one month post uh, TBI. That was partly to, because it's a collaborative study, partly the one month time point um, to be in agreement with what some of the other work in the study was doing. Uh, so that was the very initial experiment that we were doing, but we are now, have now recorded um, the day of uh, the traumatic brain injury, the day after. So we have the first 72 hours after the TBI. We also are recording um, weekly for up to that month um, and Correct me if I'm wrong, but we're waiting two months after the older cohort before we do EEG, Victoria? Three months. So we're actually waiting three months after the traumatic brain injury in the older cohort of mice to then record um, EEG to see if there's any long-term effects. So we are looking at more than just one month now. Thanks so much for your um, Is it okay? Okay, well, next question. Um, yeah, thank you. That was a great way to finish the, the conference. And uh, I have two questions. One is uh, something you already uh, brought up, which has to do with what's going on during wake years that could also be related to the slow wave sleep. So I wanted to um, um, get your thoughts on this phenomenon that's uh, taken off recently as a topic of in investigation, the sharp wave ripples mm -hmm. that are found during slow wave sleep but are also consistently found during restful wakefulness in, in animals. And I wondered if you thought about uh, the connections. Uh, I noticed that the mouse that you were for the optogenetic study, it looked like an awake mice. And I wonder- Yes, yeah, it is. You thought, <laughs> what, what are your thoughts about the connections? And are there some ways in which you're thinking about studying that? Yeah, yeah. So the sharp wave uh, ripples happen in the, in the hippocampus, and they're really thought to underlie hippocampal memory and memory consolidation, moving memory from the hippocampus potentially into the cortex for, um, for storage. Um, and we're also seeing these hippocampal ripples again uh, during sleep, but you absolutely do see them during learning, post-learning, while, while they're awake. Um, and, and what is that connection? It's, it's, a, it's a great question. I, I don't know. I don't think about sharp wave ripples as like a sleep oscillation, to be honest, um, in the way that I'm thinking about them. They might occur during sleep, but I think that they're more we know that they occur during wakefulness and during learning. So for me, the, the sharp wave ripples aren't, aren't really like a sleep um, specific oscillation that we would think about in terms of targeting from like sleep interventions or, or modulating. Um, but I do think that they're, they're critically important for hippocampal dependent consolidation. And we know that sleep is also important for aspects of hippocampal dependent consolidation. So this connects to my second question as well, because it looks from what we know so far is the sharp wave ripples have a hippocampal origination. And it looks like the hippocampus has two modes of operation, one when it outputs things and in the wakeful state, uh, currently the, the thought is that these ripples, prop, ripples propagate to the cortex and then actually experienced in terms of spontaneously arising memory, spontaneously arising thoughts, so mm -hmm. this kind of uh, or in the presumably in the dream in, in the sleeping mode, right? Those, those would be dreams. Mm -hmm. Those are just and that happen to be memory like reactivation simulations, yeah. effectively, right? And then there's the other mode of the hippocampus, which is the encoding, where the influences are more going towards it in the cortex, and that usually happens in normal experiences when there's a task being performed or during REM, actually. Mm. So it's it's a really interesting story. But I wanted to ask you if you thought about using tasks to distinguish between sleep deprivation, non-sleep deprivation, or to even uh, capture dementia 
that that are not the straightforward cognitive tasks that are, you know look at memory and and uh, working memory, but rather looking at some of the things that I talked about in terms of um, spontaneous thoughts. So mm -hmm. two relevant pieces of uh, findings. One is uh, people with hippocampal damage tend to have real trouble spontaneously generating uh, or even intentionally generating images of the future. They have mm -hmm. troubles imagining the future. And uh, they, as well as people with dementia, um, report a lot less thoughts arising during tasks. Mm. Um, so I wonder if that's something worthwhile exploring. It's not the first thing to think about when we look at tasks, mm -hmm. but I wonder if it might be something even more sensitive because um, you know, one would expect that people would have uh, more distractions uh, during if, if they have damage. But these people actually have fewer distractions. Mm. They're more in the here and now. Mm -hmm. People with dementia are more in the here and now. Uh, they don't think about the future, they don't think about the past as much, they don't time travel. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if uh, that could be an interesting thing to explore. No, uh, yeah, I think it's definitely an interesting thing to explore. And, and mind wandering during tasks or those kinds of cognitive aspects are not things that we've looked at um, or have thought to look to look at. Um, but it's certainly an interesting um, aspect of cognition, especially if you do see differences between individuals with dementia and not um, it does remind me of some of the work in like early amnesia work and also in dementia, um, looking at um, cued recall versus free recall and how cued recall tends to be more beneficial for younger adults. But once you deal with cued recalls in older adults, it can lead to poor performance with false memories or um, confusion in, in the patient population. So it actually doesn't benefit in the same way. And I'm, I'm wondering if you know, this mind wandering or this lack of mind wandering is also kind of capturing something. We we also see in some of the studies, um, I haven't done neuroimaging studies on my own, um, but in, in neuroimaging studies, they've also shown that individuals who have memory impairment who are older versus older adults who have, um, don't have memory impairment, the ones who seem more resilient or the ones who are actually performing better in, in, these, in these older cohorts, um, engage different brain regions. So you see actually more brain activation, um, this like compensation that we're seeing to help boost resilience. So they're able to tap into these other mechanisms uh, to support their cognition. So I don't know if one of those resilient mechanisms is avoiding that mind wandering, wandering or increasing the focus as, as you might see. It's interesting. Thank you. Great question. Um, we, I, I mean, the short answer is we need more research to understand exactly what it is about low wave sleep um, that could be uniquely beneficial to Alzheimer's. So a couple of the thoughts uh, that, that people are, are looking at, one is this idea that the slow wave sleep aspect is actually promoting this more lymphatic clearance. Um, which could be helping to clear out, you know, one of the proteins that they've been looking at with lymphatic clearance is amyloid. So if we think about amyloid accumulating for decades, and we think that this accumulation of amyloid is then leading to this accumulation of tau and driving you along the continuum, um, that actually, you know, slowing down the accumulation of amyloid or clearing out amyloid um, could be beneficial. And so that could be one mechanism. And, and the recent drug, um, development in Alzheimer's disease is specifically looking at clearing amyloid very rapidly out of brains of individuals with dementia. So you could imagine that if slow wave sleep is helping to promote this glymphatic clearance, that perhaps slow wave sleep is, is actually reducing the accumulation of amyloid. The other thing that slow wave sleep um, is thought to do is really help with that memory consolidation, um, transfer memories from the hippocampus into the cortex aligned up. I mean, the alignment of these slow wave ripples, the hippocampal ripples, the sleep spindles, these slow wave oscillations is really a hot topic right now in memory, in thinking that these slow oscillations aligned with these hippocampal ripples and the sleep spindles are really how we have this sleep promoting memory consolidation aspect. Um, so that could be another way that 
slow wake sleep in particular is helping with cognitive resilience or, or promotions of, of cognition. Um, but yeah, that, that other than that, it's like, what is it about slow wave sleep? The other thing I'll say is slow wave sleep is considered the most restorative stage. Um, whether or not you like the term restorative, I think it, people un understand what people mean by restorative. Um, but that is the stage that is thought to be the most restorative. So there could be other things, and there probably are other things happening in that stage of sleep that is just beneficial for overall health, brain health, cognitive health. A very complicated relationship, but certainly if you have higher BMI, you're more at risk for apnea. That's a very well known link. Um, and we know that if you have obstructive sleep apnea, you're at a much higher risk of heart disease, stroke. So all these vascular risk factors are tied very um, closely with apnea. Now with apnea, is it the sleep fragmentation? We know that sleep fragmentation is actually uh, stressful. Uh, we know that from animal work. Um, not necessarily that humans would report that sleep fragmentation is stressful, but in, in terms of measurements of, of the stress of that, we do know that it's stressful, which can lead to other um, vascular risk factors. With apnea, it's complicated because you also get the hypoxia, right? You get the reduction in oxygen. And so how that is contributing to these vascular risk factors, um, they also suggest that this type of apnea can uh, lead to obesity. So not only does obesity increase your risk of apnea, but having apnea can also um, lead to metabolic uh, risk factors and metabolic changes. So th that relationship is, is, is very complicated. Thanks so much, everyone.